This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode 136. Recorded on September 29th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month and for our audience. First two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. We're almost out of September. Yes, indeed. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Is your team undefeated? 4-0. Oh. oh my gosh. <laughs> That's why you're so happy. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Are you well, Michael? I am. That's good. I have to tell everyone. Just parenthetically, that this month I am at Columbia for 34 years. Wow. wow. Congratulations. I know to Elio, that's not a big deal because you were good just, for Columbia. You were just at Tufts for 34 years, but this is my only job I've ever had. So, and you started when you were a lad, obviously. <laughs> I started, I came here in, in September 82 out of my postdoc. I was 29 years old at the time, and um, I came into my open lab and, uh, I said, what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> you were the dog that caught the car. And Harry Ginsburg was the chairman who hired me. And uh, oh, was he? He said, uh, here's your lab. And you can have that minus 70 freezer, but it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. That's the way it was back then. Anyway, 34 years of polio. Uh, today we have for you. Everyone's silent. I'm sorry I, I brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to absorb all 34 years of polio this. is pretty sobering. Well, now we we don't work on it any longer, really. We work on Zika virus and other things. Someday we may hear about it. Today we have for you a snippet and a paper. And the snippet is brought to you by Michael. All right. So the snippet I'm going to bring with you is something out of the journal PLOS Pathogens. And it's in a section called Pearls. And it was authored by Simon Dorman, Jason Cole, and Victor Nizay. And we had Dr. Nize on TWIM number 41 when Vincent and I had an opportunity to interview Dr. Nize in San Francisco at the 52nd meeting of uh, the Interscience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, or ICAC. So we talked to him four years ago. Wow. And Time flies, Michael. Time flies when you're having fun. So that's wow. TWIM 41. Wow. So you can hear Dr. Nize, the senior author on this particular pearl. And it's in, entitled, I'm drawing a blank. It's entitled uh, Conquering, Conquering Neutrophils. Neutrophils. Very short you, title. <laughs> yeah, it's a short title. That's why I'm stumbling on it. <laughs> you expected and, something longer. Yeah. And it's it's a really neat way of presenting a lot of information that's essential for understanding pathogenesis and how microbes interact with the host and how the host interacts with the, the microbes. So I'm going to use a, a military metaphor throughout my presentation of this snippet because when you look at the only figure in this particular paper, it is absolutely spectacular. And there's two images. There's the neutrophil that we're going to be talking or devoting a lot of our discussion about. And then there's the canonical pathogen, the group A streptococci, the evil streptococci. And in this figure, what they have decked out is all of the kit 
that the neutrophil has at its disposal to combat an infection when it's wandering around our bodies. Now, the neutrophil, consider it as a fully kitted out Marine, the first individual to hit the beaches. And if you've ever seen a soldier hitting the beaches, they come fully laden with everything they need to <laughs> effectively combat the enemy. And the neutrophil is, is no different. They have a unique set of skills. They have things called granules that are effectively their grenades. They have a whole set of strategies that will take energy weapons, principally electrons, and convert them into reactive oxygen species. And you can imagine this as the weaponry from Star Wars, where you see the lightning bolts coming out, and those lightning bolts go out and will actually attack the Group A streptococcus, and they can literally engulf the pathogen and eat it alive, wall it off, and continue to throw these things after it. And on their utility belt, the neutrophil has something else. It's called these neutrophil extracellular traps. And it's just as the name implies, they, they create a net, literally a net to catch pathogens. And this beautiful net-like structure is composed of DNA, histones, and all sorts of other little curious things that can go after the pathogen external to the neutrophil and inactivate it. But you want to say that this is an act of kamikaze, isn't it? It this is. Marine is now dying and in the process it gets rid of its DNA and makes its extracellular traps. Isn't that Correct. Right? Correct. That's exactly where I going, was going with it. Uh, <laughs> neutrophils are this army of white blood cells that we have in our body and each day our bone marrow produces 10 to the 11th cells per day. That's one tenth of a trillion cells. That's just an incredible number to me. And these things last for five, five days in our circulation. So the half-life of a neutrophil. That's why you have to make so many, right? That's why you have to make so many. They're short-lived, but they come fully loaded. They're terminally differentiated. And unfortunately for us poor biologists, is there's no cell line that can make lots of neutrophils. The only way we can get them is we have to bleed our colleagues or donors in order to get the white blood cells in order and then separate them out in order to get the neutrophils. So we make 10 to the 11th per day or a 10th of a trillion, and we have on hand at any moment in time five times uh, or excuse me, um, 500 times 10 to the 11th wandering around or a half a trillion wandering around our bodies looking for a fight. They're literally out there and they have these incredible sensors that can detect and spot a bacterial, fungal, or parasitic infections. So in this pearl, what the three authors so wonderfully do in single paragraph form is they take us through uh, nine parts of the story. The first thing they'll teach us is the evidence for the essential role of neutrophils in fighting an infection. And they talk about, you know, how we make so many of them, how they're short lived. And they then introduce the concept that is the purview of many of the second year medical students taking immunology for the first time, because they learn about genetic lesions that humans have and some of us will develop chronic granulomatous disease, which is characterized by a reduction in the concentrations of NADPH oxidase activity, which makes effectively the lightning bolts or the, the lightsaber of the neutrophil. Or there's another genetic deficiency in which there's a leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So mother nature through the genetic lesions that humans have uh, accumulated illustrate the importance of neutrophils in fighting infections. Then they introduce us to the enemy, the bacteria, and they're, they're using their favorite pathogen, the group A streptococcus. And group A streptococci, as everyone knows, is the causative agent of strep throat. And when I introduced 
uh, the streptococci to the medical or dental students, I asked them a question. Why was your grandmother so terrified if you got a strep infection? And they all look at me and shrug their shoulders because this is the generation where antibiotics are ubiquitous. And a strep throat is a no big thing. And I point out to them at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, a strep throat infection had a lethality between 80 and 90 percent, depending on the strain and what type of disease it actually transformed into. So this organism is built for war. And healthy folks, of course, are at a low risk for invasive bacterial infections. However, group A streptococci has the ability to resist our defenses. And as um, a review in blood said, or was it, I think it was Nizé said, it, they have an innate immunity to our innate immunity. And when you look at it, so they're setting up the enemy as being a true enemy. The third section they take us into is the antibacterial arsenal deployed by the neutrophils. And how the neutrophils will then take and disarm the group A streptococci. And I've already described how the neutrophils are loaded for bear with these anti-infective strategy. The first thing they'll do is they have the ability to uptake or undergo the process of phagocytosis where they'll actually engulf the offending agent at the site of the infection. And then what happens is they'll actually, uh, the phagosome will actually merge with a lysosome that has all of these uh, antimicrobial molecules. And then they'll undergo a process termed degranulization, which is the equivalent of setting off the grenade. And the microbe, of course, dies from the uh, toxic materials that are present in that grenade structure. But what's most fascinating, I think, in this snippet, if you haven't ever discovered the wonder of neutrophils, is the recruitment. And this is what so, was so especially compelling. And I hadn't thought about this in a while because I knew neutrophils were the wonder, wonder white blood cells, is, is that they are really the commander in chief. You have this massive amount of cells wandering our body and they're asking a simple question, where is the infection? And they have these detectors and they're out there and they are effectively the shock and awe troops that are literally trying to find where the site of infections are. And the neutrophils are attracted by the chemokines that will bind to induce selectins via the beta integrins. And these low affinity interactions decelerate the neutrophil as it's going through circulation, allowing it to roll along the inner surface of the blood vessel and then literally leak into the site of in the infection. And then they'll call for... Uh, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Uh, it's worth pointing out that the majority of the neutrophils are not in circulation normally. In fact, they are stuck on the walls of small vessels. So they become like the reserve troops, which can be called upon. So their recruitment is getting going from the wall of the vessels into the circulation and therefore finding the place of infection. So it's really a, the analogy, the military analogy holds very well. And the additional recruitment that Elio was just going into comes from the macrophage and other immune cells that are literally being attacked by the infectious agent. And they release the IL-1 beta to stimulate the production of IL-8 by the epithelial and endothelial cells in a positive feedback loop. And that's effectively how the neutrophils come to the rescue, if you will. So then how does the group A strep become innately resistant to our system. And these clever little streptococci have these surface-associated serine proteases, and they cleave human IL-8 to suppress this chemokine-mediated neutrophil recruitment. And they go on to list the other genetic factors that streps has to defend itself against the neutrophil. The bottom line 
is the degradation of these chemotactic factors is thus the key to neutrophil evasion by this evil group A streptococci, and it's the hallmark of pathogenesis. And And I'll just point out, if I could, um, in addition to figure one, which beautifully summarizes the many um, anti-neutrophil factors made by group A strep, they include table one, which lists all the virulence factors that specifically combat particular activities of the neutrophil and provide a reference. So this is a great resource for any students or teachers who um, need to get up to speed on this field and use it um, in the classroom or for oral exams. I I mean, this is a must read for every graduate student who is studying for their qualifying exams, trying to understand the host pathogen relationship. It's laid out in this this nine paragraph function and it's really only a nine paragraph paper and there's really one idea items five through nine are phagocytosis oxidative burst degranulation the net or netosis if you will and finally their perspectives on how to do additional research and you know, I think we all are, are familiar with the, the phagocytosis, and it's really a judo match, if you will, between the neutrophil and the group A strep. I mean, it, they're literally throwing each other on the mat, and that's what table one is all about, showing you chemotactic recruitment and the virulence factor that strep has to combat the neutrophil. The phagocytosis that the section that we're in, I think anyone who's ever sat through a medical micro class and knows about streptococci will immediately give me M protein because M protein, as we know, is the one that's responsible for the rheumatic syndrome that's often associated with strep throat and results in rheumatic heart disease. And M protein, because it cross reacts with our, one of our cardiac um, uh, proteins, the immune system effectively attacks us. And you can begin to see that what M protein does for strep, it's a surface protein that binds the complement inhibitory proteins to prevent complement deposition and phagocytosis. You know, and go ahead, Elio. No, I'm just, uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were wrapping up. Uh, this is really a great paper and I'm glad you brought it up. I think the last thing I was going to talk about is specifically the the nets or the netosis because this is the one of the lesser known activities. And when Michelle and I were having uh, a discussion about this electronically as to whether or not this was twimmable, I think we both agreed that the net or netosis was really one of the things that I think our uh, seasoned readers or listeners would like as well as our initial learners to learn about how net works. And these are the neutrophil components that contribute to the whole gamut of uh, stimulating the microbial factors and the host immune mediators. And this is really the, uh, I guess, the brave new world of um, developing pharmacology of trying to figure out how to go after these particular aspects. Michelle, do you want to add anything to that? Um, Well, I was going to say in general, this paradigm of group A strep, which is normally colonizes humans and has co-evolved under the selective pressure of our immune system, there's a parallel with Staphylococcus aureus, also um, a, a microbe that lives on many of us but can cause really terrible invasive disease. And it too has got a long list of virulence factors that specifically inactivate particular components of the neutrophils arsenal. So there are two really beautiful examples of the um, coevolution of a microbe with the human immune system and how microbes, because they replicate so much faster, um, have evolved really specific mechanisms to, to disarm particular um, pathways. It's a, it's a beautiful story in host pathogen interactions, both for group A strep and staph aureus. And I think that's why PLOS pathogens put it in their pearl section, because it yeah. truly is a pearl in terms of explaining this dynamic of our immune system and how it interacts with microbes. 
So that's the great snippet. show. Beautiful presentation, my really nice. Thank you, Michael. This uh, episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, which is the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service started by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. That means you're going to get real science shows. You can watch it on the web or on any of the uh, platforms like Roku and Apple TV. In 196 countries worldwide, they have science, technology, nature, history, documentaries, interviews, lectures, all real stuff. It includes science, Stephen Hawking's universe, where Stephen Hawking talks about the history of astronomical theories and technology, deep time history, the 14 billion year history of the universe, and underwater wonders of the national parks. They also have one of the biggest ultra high definition libraries on the internet. They have monthly and annual plans that start at $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIM. Now, Alio is going to tell us all about the outer membrane. But before I do that, I have a piece of information sure. that seems to be appropriate for the election season. <laughs> I got a message from Jeff Carr, who's the ASM archivist and comes up with amazing stories about a story that unfolded in 1967 when Senator Warren Magnuson of the state of Washington introduced into legislation of the Senate a bill to change the name of Salmonella to Sanella. And the reason is that he thought that Salmonella would interfere with the sales of the salmon, which is fished in his state of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> if you can imagine, the uh, then director of the American Type Culture Collection and chairman of the Taxonomy Committee for the ASM, William Clark, let him have it. He said, should this unfortunate bill be passed by the U.S. House and Senate and become law, it would, one, make a laughing stock of our esteemed national legislative body <laughs> in the eyes of a sizable segment of our own citizens as well as the eyes of people and governments abroad, break faith with scientists, etc., and hamstrung a great number of microbiologists, etc. So <laughs> if this bill were passed, no self-respecting microbiologist could in conscience pay any attention to it. <laughs> Uh, so the shenanigans that go on in Washington are not new. That's what. That's my point. Okay. Let's yeah, that's on. great. That's great. A public service message brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the paper I'm talking about is by a consortium of various labs from the Pasteur Institute, uh, a lab from the University of Lyon, and from uh, Munich. Germany. The authors are Antunes, Poppleton, Kling, Krish, Squalo, Dupuy, Rochier, Armenet, Belouin, and Simonetta Gribaldo brings up the rear. The title is Phylogenomic Analysis Supports the Ancestral Presence of LPS Outer Membranes in the Firmicutes. Now, why is this exciting? Uh, not everybody who's listening to this knows what Firmicutes are. They are uh, one of the two groups of gram-positive bacteria. That is, the whole world of bacteria is divided up into gram-positives and gram-negatives, which has to do with how they stain in a certain procedure called the gram stain. And if you go by the traditional divisions which are uh, taught widely and widely accepted, the uh, gram-positives have a single skin, a single membrane surrounded by a cell wall, whereas the gram-negatives have two membranes, one an inner membrane. Outside of that is a thin layer of cell wall material called peptidoglycan, and outside of that is an outer membrane. So that is kind of the way we think of it and the way we taught it and so forth. It turns out it's been known for some time there are exceptions because in the firmicutes, one of the two large groups of gram positives, are some bacteria which contain an outer membrane. 
wow, <laughs> this has been known for this for some time, although it wasn't known that the guys who carry this, namely Vellonella, a common bug in the human body, is actually a firmicute. Uh, I want to make an analogy to this. This is so stunning it reminds me of a story of the Baron of Munchausen. Remember the tales of Munchausen, <laughs> the great tales? Well, the Baron went hunting one day, and he saw a beautiful stag, a deer, and he tried to shoot him, but he was out of bullets, so he quickly chewed on some <laughs> cherries he had and took the cherry pits and put them in his rifle and shot the deer in the head, and the deer went, went about his business. A year later, the baron goes back to the same forest and he sees the deer who is now sprouting a cherry tree from his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> to me, founding LPS in Fermicutes is like a deer with a cherry tree coming out of it. <laughs> it is so incredible. So the, this article deals with the evidence from a, what they call a phylogenomic analysis, which is really looking at bioinformatically rather vast information genomic information which exists on the firmicutes. And the basic thing they find is that there are two groups called the, excuse me for the long term, they're called nevat, negativi cutis, <laughs> cutis in skin. And the other is called the halan, ooh, it's, it's a tough one, the halanerobialis two groups which are sort of outliers in the sense that if you look at the phylogeny, they really stick out. They are the negative acuities are on the top of a big tree and the others are at the bottom. And they're very distinct and very separate, yet they fit in the firmicutes. So they confirm the fact that it's been known for some time by doing uh, ultra thin sections. They show that sure enough, these guys have authentic looking outer membranes and they look like they have an LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is most gram negative of characteristics in what is otherwise a gram positive group. So they, they go at it and they look at this in some considerable detail and they find out that many of the genes involved in outer membrane biosynthesis, including LPS, are highly conserved in these two groups. Highly conserved. So they have a nice graph. It shows that uh, they are almost, they're, they're really awfully close with regard to this ability. So they have all the genes, or many of the genes that they look at, necessary for making LPS, for making outer membrane. And so that is the story. So this is not any old outer membrane. It's a gram-negative kind of outer membrane, LPS and all. Mm. And this is what I find so stunning. So then the question, so there is a lot of detail here, and uh, it's really nice, a nice summation of the knowledge that exists. I, I, like, I like the paper a lot. I think very, very well presented, very well written, and so forth. Now, the question becomes, who came first? The gra uh. the well, let's call, let's give him a name, by the way. There's a name that the guy named Gupta invented, which is very appropriate. The guys with the two membranes are called diderms, derm as in dermis, and the gram positive, which classically, the classic gram positives, which have a single layer only, are called the monoderms. So I'm going to talk about diderms and monoderms, meaning the guys with two membranes, and monoderms, the guys with one membrane. Is that okay? So mm. far, so good. That's good. Okay. The question, who came first? Now, any simple logic would say, gee, the simpler one, which is the monoderm structure, should come first, and then you build up on that an outer membrane, and you have a diderm. Isn't that right? Isn't that what simple logic would demand, right? Well, simple logic doesn't always work in nature because the simple logic is our simple logic, not nature's. So this has been proposed by Cavalier Smith in uh, about, when was it, in 19, wait a minute, I'll tell you in a second, he proposed this in 2006, 10 years ago, that the first bacteria that to emerge had two membrane layers, they were diderms, and then some lost it and became monoderms that way. Now, this begs the question, how did the diderms 
occur? How did this happen? But that's a general question about the origin of life, essentially. It's a, it's a question we don't want to get into because we don't know anything about it. But the proposal is that from the beginning, bacteria had, or very early on, bacteria developed the didermic structure, and they went to town. They, were, they became the dominant form, and then eventually the... Um, the uh, outer membrane got lost and they became monoderms. That's pretty much the gist of the paper. They go into some detail about saying, why is it not that these particular firmicutes we're talking about, these two strange groups, these outliers, why can we say that they did not acquire these genes by lateral gene transfer, by horizontal gene transfer? By this we mean acquiring genes across species, not from your ancestors, but across existing species. And that, of course, is known to happen on a very large scale in the, in the bacterial world. However, there's problems with that. And one of the problems is that the number of genes involved in making an outer membrane is formidable. They don't quote the number, but it's, maybe it's, it's over 100. So you would have to have a package of about 100 genes going across from one bacterial species to another, which seems strange. In addition, the finding of these two outlier groups and nothing in between speaks against the idea that this is horizontal gene transfer. So uh, to me, uh, this is the... The deer with the uh, cherry tree growing out of its head, typical gram-positive, typical firmicutes bacteria sporting what is a typical gram-negative bacteria. And I think life is just not that simple. That they, we are the, the rules that we love to make because they simplify our teaching, they simplify our thinking. All those rules are, you know, human constructs. So we have to be ready for accepting that yeah they make it easier to write test questions because it's a binary <laughs> and uh, i think that well you know th that's the most frustrating thing is there's always the exception to the rule and right. and the other thing is you know evolution is generally a reductionist approach you put everything into the spaceship that will support life that you need and then as time goes on, you decide whether or not you need that and you throw it away. And so maybe that's what happened is the outer membrane got thrown away as the peptidyl right. glycan layer got yeah. thicker and thicker and it was less energetically, it was less energy, well, it, it conferred fitness or whatever, or whatever reason, but maybe that's what happened. It's true. But I it's, agree, well, Michael. The, it's the fact of the matter is that both coexist. You yes. Know, you would think. One solution is better than the other. Let's adopt it. That's not the case. There are but but in, if we think about evolution as random mutation and then you know selection for the fittest, for me, it's much easier to think of the progenitor having two membranes and then gradually losing that second membrane than it is for me to imagine how by random chance you could go from one membrane to two. Because it's not simply that second membrane, but you need all the transporters. Um, yeah, that's true the complex biology to get those two membranes working together. So I found this really very pleasing. And, and I just want to highlight one of their figures that I found especially uh, convincing was figure three, where they laid out the um, map, the chromosomal map positions of operons that are involved oh, yes. in particular pathways for the outer membrane. Mm -hmm. And they do this for four different lineages of the firmicutes. And you can see that whole blocks of genes are conserved among these four different lineages on the chromosome. Right. Um, and it extends for, for large distances. So it's, it's really convincing that these four different lineages have a common ancestor. Uh, it's too bad that they don't show us what, the, what these genes look like in E. coli. I missed that. Mm. So I, they, they are all highly conserved among these four species, two groups of firmicutes. But uh, do they look like, do the genes in a typical gram-negative look the same? And I don't know the answer. 
you can do that experiment by going to a journal that you used to edit, Elio, and that's EcoCell, and ask the question if FTSZ is there sure, and all of course those others. Can, yeah. Yep. I just the classes of genes they're showing in these four lineages of Firmicutes have to do with LPS synthesis, LPS transport, outer mm-hmm. membrane protein assembly, flagella, attachment of peptidoglycan. So these are like key gram-negative pathways that are conserved in these Firmicutes. It says to me that these auto-membrane-carrying Firmicutes did not invent a new kind of auto-membrane. This is a typical auto-membrane. Yep. Because at least, at least at the glance, biochemically speaking, these are all the enzymes and, and proteins that you need to make an outer membrane, a typical outer membrane. So it was not a; it was really adopting an existing structure, not inventing a new one. Right. Which is which is why which is the argument that they came first. Yep. You know, this is this is a, I think I find it a very convincing argument. Very elegant. And one of the interesting references that they cite in their discussion was a paper by Arthur Koch, who in 2003 wrote in Trends in Microbiology, were gram-positive rods the first bacteria. So if you're interested, it's in, it's, uh, in the public domain, and so it's easily yeah. downloadable. Well, where gram-positive that, that was rods, the conventional view. The, the, yes. the other people said that too. So the conventional view was you first make a membrane and then you make two membranes. Yeah. And this is what's setting that particular upper card completely. And I, I would commend you, if, if you want to have some fun, read the trends paper because trends papers are generally easier to, to get through in terms of setting the stage and they bring a lot of the primary literature to bear on the argument. And then take a look at this paper and see if you're convinced. Mm-hmm. Which came first, the positives or the negatives? It, it is, it's a fun, fun activity to, to look at. Oh, and I'm, I'm sure the argument isn't finished. Oh, no, be, it's, it's nowhere near done. Yeah. It's Another nowhere near done. Another um, interesting case that they built is that sporulation itself may have contributed uh-huh. to this loss of the outer membrane and that the outer membrane may have been lost um, to increase the fitness of firmicutes that um, were capable of sporulating and germinating. That is, without the outer membrane, they could be more efficient in sporulation and germination. So those were interesting ideas that I think will be developed um, as this research continues. What I liked about this paper was the genes LOL. <laughs> Laugh out loud? <laughs> Yeah, I think that an LO first suggestion of an LOL system in the Firmicutes is one of the subheadings. I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. This is great stuff. I really like it. Uh, and it's very thought provoking. And the whole idea of losing or gaining complexity is a really interesting one. And uh, I'm not sure we can general statements, but in this case, I agree with Michelle's idea. All right. I want to tell you about. The other sponsor of this episode, Drobo, they make storage solutions for your computer that are secure and redundant. They make different sized uh, storage arrays, five drive bays, eight drive bays, or 12 drive bays. And uh, these, uh, when you put hard drives in them, they get fused into a single large hard drive that you can use to store your data on your computer. Now, I want to tell you about how they were first invented, it turns out that the person who founded Drobo, he went on his honeymoon, he took pictures, and then sometime later he lost all his pictures because his hard drive failed. Ouch. And he said, Mm. there has to be a better way. And he thought of Drobo, where it's very hard to lose things because your data are protected. And the way it works is you have multiple hard drives in a Drobo. If one of them fails, you just take it out and put a new one in and all the data are reproduced because if you have three or four or five drives, the data is multiplied, I should say, across all of the drives. And they're very easy to use. You have a light on front that tells you if the drive is getting full and if it fills up, uh, you just put a new one in of greater capacity and you move on. So the, uh, the inventor of Drobo had to invent a new technology after his uh, pictures were lost. That's often how we move on in technology by uh, some kind of need. Uh, And the result is Drobo, really simple to use. It will protect your data forever. It just works. Microbe TV listeners can save $100 off their purchase of a Drobo, either a 5, an 8, or a 12-drive system at drobostore.com. Just use the discount code MICROBE100. 
We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. All right, we have a couple of emails here to go through before we finish up. First is from Steve, who writes, Hi, Microbophiles. Here's an interesting little historic snippet from The Lancet. He sends an article uh, from The Lancet. Venerable bacteria in another interesting history of science piece. The Lancet gets bully over Koch's bovine tuberculosis samples, but not over the tragedy of him advising that this form of the pathogen was not significant for human health and thus delayed the introduction of basic meat and milk hygiene and testing. The name of the article is Koch's Culture Tubes by Bill and Helen Bynum. If you're interested in the history of microbiology, you should check it out. The culture tubes. You can still see these in a museum, I believe. Maybe this one is an old photo. Anyway, thank you, Steve, for that. Next is from Anthony, who also sends us an article. He writes, The plague of 1665 was the last major outbreak of bubonic plague in Britain, killing nearly a quarter of London's population. It's taken a year to confirm initial findings from a suspected Great Plague burial pit during excavation work on the Crosswell site at Liverpool Street. About 3,500 burials have been uncovered during excavation of that site. Wow. In Germany, molecular paleopathologist Kristen Boss drilled out the tooth pulp and he sequenced uh, the DNA in there. And uh, they could find DNA signatures uh, of Yersinia pestis showing that it was circulating at the time of death. We don't know why the Great Plague was the last major outbreak. These are things we're trying to sort out. So that's a cool story as well. In fact, if I remember from uh, doing a twim at Biodefense earlier this year, uh, we I learned, and his name is escaping me. Who's the Michelle? Who's the plague fellow at Northwestern in Chicago? Oh, who's um, yeah? What's the name, Michael? Wyndham Latham. Wyndham Latham, right? He was my guest. He said they were sequencing these the tooth pulp and looking at human sequences, and they had this contaminant. They didn't know what it was. It turned out to be Yersinia. <laughs> <laughs> Oops! Isn't that funny how things happen? Yep. Serendipity. And um, our last one is from Steve, who writes, just to say thanks for your interesting discussion of the points I raised regarding uses of gut gas analysis and fingerprinting and hand hygiene in the context of declining use of copper coinage. One or two of my points weren't expressed well. I hadn't intended to convey the sense of a general increase in the spread of infectious diseases, but more in the increase in spread of antibiotic resistant strains. Widespread use of antibiotics in hand and surface cleaners has produced the general decline in infection that the team noted, but previously there would have been a good deal of copper in circulation and bacteria on fingers would frequently be brought directly into contact, which would kill them. This may have held back the spread of resistance. It does strike me that from what I hear in your podcast, antibiotic resistance does not have to arise de novo very frequently. It's part of the general variation, which just needs to be selected by knocking out the remainder. Also, you have noted that horizontal transfer, even between unrelated bacterial species begins almost immediately when they are mixed together. Given this, it seems to me that antibiotic resistance has taken a surprising long time to spread and become a major health concern. It could be that the metals in our environment were holding it back until recently when our metal pipes and handrails were replaced. The second remark about mosquito stance left me puzzled as to why it wasn't understood. Having spent many a night scanning my walls and ceilings for nearly invisible mozzies, that wine in one's ear, I become familiar with the two back legs in the air stance of the common mosquitoes. He sends a photo. I assume this was a general thing among those that hold themselves at an angle to the surface. But following your team's confusion, I checked more Google images and see that there are indeed as many pictures where all six legs are used as there are those where the back legs are held aloft. I don't know how many species I'm looking at. Well, some species, by the way, uh, hold themselves at an angle to the whatever they're biting the skin. And some hold themselves horizontally. It's actually a species-dependent thing. However, the whole issue of whether all the legs are used or not, I asked Kristen Bernard, who's a virologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who happens to study mosquito-borne viruses, and she wrote, mosquitoes often don't use the last pair of legs, but will use all six for balance, especially once blood-fed. So there you go. They're drunk. They're drunk. They're using it as a cane. Yeah, they're heavy. They're really full and heavy, so they have to balance themselves. <laughs> yes. So there you go, Steve. We, I don't think we were confused as to we were 
uh, we knew, I sort of knew that they were used in some situations, and Kristen, who knows much more than I do, confirms that. If we could um, expand on the antibiotic resistance yep. um, component. It's true that antibiotic resistance is very common. It doesn't have to be reinvented because out in the microbial world, microbes have been using these molecules to compete, try to um, fend off competitors Mm. so that they can consume the local resources. So they are very common even without use of therapeutic antibiotics. We also know that when you carry these antibiotic resistance genes, it's expensive. It, It costs the cell energy to make the components. And so if they're not under selective pressure, if they're not experiencing the antibiotic, they'll lose them. So it's those two factors together that Mm -hmm. um, determine the frequency of antibiotic resistance in our populations in humans. And not only are they the resistance genes out there in in nature, but they're ancient, right? They've been found in very, very old uh, specimens. Even in populations of people who are isolated from Mm-hmm. clinical use of antibiotics. Right. So we know that they're really a microbial invention. Yep. All right. I want to tell you about the ASM scientific writing and publishing online course. You can register for this course right now. Uh, this course will explore writing and publishing with ASM journals editor. It will be an interactive webinar series. You'll cover titles, abstracts, figures, figure legends, and the entire manuscript review process. So if you're just starting out, in science and you're you're writing your first paper, or if you've been around and you want to polish up, you you should register for this course. It takes place January through April of 2017. The registration deadline is December 1st, so you have some time. You should go to this website to uh, learn more, bit.ly slash SWPOC17, bit.ly slash SWPOC17. Of course, that stands for Scientific Writing Publishing online course number 17, we think. What a great ASM. service. That's a really great idea. It is. For ASM to offer that. And it's a webinar. You don't have to go anywhere. Right. Yeah. You can look at it on your computer and learn things. Yes, yeah, another great service of, of this wonderful society. And, and neat that you can interact directly with some ASM journal editors. Yep. So people that have a lot of experience. Uh, this is TWIM136. You can find it at iTunes. You can also get it on your smartphone iPhone, Android device, with any number of programs that will download it for free. And uh, think about becoming a patron of TWIM and all the Microbe TV family of science shows that we do. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute to learn about options for that. We do like getting your questions and comments. Please send them to TWIM at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you all. Go blue, right? Yeah, we're taking on Wisconsin, <laughs> another highly ranked team. Oh, that's so it's a big, the, big showdown. This weekend? Yep. Where, where is it? At your place? Right here at the big house. Oh, my. And you're going, forecast, of course. Forecast is for rain. I'll enjoy. Ooh. That'll be some contest. Yeah. <laughs> Alio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. My pleasure, as always. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandayan and Ray Otega for their technical help. I also want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. Find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Bye.